Hall D is the newest of Jefferson Lab's four experimental halls and was built as part of the CBAF 12 GEV upgrade project, completed in 2017. Located on the opposite corner of the CBAF accelerator from the other three halls, Hall D is the only one that receives the highest energy electrons generated in CBAF. On entering the Hall D complex, the electrons strike a razor-thin slice of diamond, generating a beam of high-energy photons used in experiments. Scientists hope to capture signatures of particles called hybrid mesons in Hall D. These particles are made up of the same building blocks as protons and neutrons, called quarks. But they also contain an active component of the strong force, or glue, that binds the quarks tightly together. Hall D experimental data will help scientists from around the world reveal new subatomic particles, help solve the mystery of why quarks are never found alone, and shed light on the mysterious force that binds together every nucleus in every atom in the universe. Welcome to Bite Size Science. <clears throat> this is Jefferson Labs uh, lunchtime virtual series uh, with lectures for the public. I'm Justin Stevens. I'm a professor of physics at William & Mary, and I'm happy to be here today to tell you about nuclear physics and exploring the exotic. Uh, this is the second lecture in our series uh, where we're covering topics from uh, particle physics, nuclear physics, uh, accelerators, uh, exotic particles, uh, and even artificial intelligence. Um, these presentations are really meant for the public, and so we really encourage you to add your questions uh, to the chat feature on YouTube uh, during the broadcast, and I'll try to do my best to answer those questions after uh, the lecture today. So with that, let me begin. Um, as I said, I'm a professor uh, at William & Mary, where I uh, both teach and, and do research here at, at Jefferson Lab. And I'm one of uh, more than a thousand uh, of folks that do research here at the lab. We're not employees of the lab, but uh, this is our research focus, and um, we're really a group from around the world uh, doing that, um, an international base of, of users. Um, and what I'd like to tell you about today is, is the research I do in, in nuclear physics and uh, the, looking for exotic particles uh, at Jefferson Lab. So if you were able to attend the first uh, of our lectures by the, our director, Stuart Henderson, uh, you heard that the Jefferson Lab is really aimed at, at studying uh, matter at the smallest distance scales we can, can probe. Uh, and so we, we know about matter that's everywhere around us. Um, it's composed of molecules, uh, things you might have learned about in a chemistry class. Uh, and then inside of the molecules, we have atoms. Inside of the atoms, atomic nuclei. Uh, and inside of those atomic nuclei, uh, we get to the realm of, of nuclear physics where we have protons and neutrons. Uh, and to give you a sense of the scale of the distances here, we're talking about protons being about the size of a femtometer or one millionth of a billionth of a meter. Um, and so those protons are, are the building blocks of atomic nuclei, but we know that there are even smaller building blocks inside of those protons and neutrons, uh, and those <clears throat> go by the name of quarks and gluons. And so the picture you, show, you see shown here uh, is that of a, a proton composed of three quarks, these colored balls inside of uh, the proton sphere, and the gluons are these uh, connective tissue, uh, the spring uh, structures that flex and hold the quarks inside of, uh, of the proton. Uh, and what uh, you heard about from, uh, from Director Henderson was uh, at JLab, uh, we're really aiming at moving to these smallest distance scales and, and probing uh, not just this simple picture of, of the proton with three quarks, but a more complicated picture where we know that the proton is composed of uh, these three quarks at the internal structure, but also a haze of gluons and quark anti quark pairs that um, exist around it. And so, what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit more background about that uh, strong nuclear force that drives these quark and gluon interactions uh, and how we can look for and, and study exotic particles uh, at Jefferson Lab. So, if these quarks and gluons are the building blocks of, uh, the fundamental building blocks of uh, nuclear matter, uh, we'd like to know what kinds of particles you can make with them. 
Uh, and generally, we refer to particles composed of quarks and gluons as hadrons. Uh, and examples of these are the protons and neutrons we were discussing previously. Now, there's a couple of groups that these hadrons break down into, and the first one is called a baryon. Uh, and these baryons contain three quarks, and uh, protons and neutrons fall into this category. Um, and to give you a little more background about baryons, they have these three quarks inside of them, uh, with the gluons holding them and confining them inside of the proton. Um, but these quarks and gluons uh, have some interesting properties. Uh, now, the quarks uh, have an electric charge, sort of like an electron has a negative charge, uh, and the quarks can have a uh, positive or negative charge. The gluons are neutral uh, and don't have a, a positive or a negative charge. Um, but the quarks and gluons carry a new kind of charge, different from electric charge, called a color charge. And the forces between the quarks and gluons are described by uh, a theory called quantum chromodynamics, where the chromo is the descriptor for that color interaction. Um, another more colloquial name for this uh, force is the strong nuclear force, which I'll use uh, for the rest of, of today's talk. Um, but all the hadrons we see in nature uh, have the property that they are color neutral. And so the example of the baryon, you have a, a red, green, and blue uh, quark uh, with those uh, color charges. And when you combine them, you get a white or color neutral object. And I should say this uh, color is really just a way of describing uh, a three component type of uh, interaction for this new uh, color charge. It's not a visual color that you would see uh, with these uh, quartz beings um, really uh, minuscule on scale. Um, but there's another category of particles I'd like to talk about, uh, which are mesons. And so here we have uh, not three quarks, but a quark and the antiparticle of the quark called an antiquark. Um, and here that pair of a quark and an antiquark are held together by, again, this uh, gluonic bond uh, between those two. Um, and in this case, we would have uh, a color and an anti-color charge. And so this, these antiparticles of the quarks have um, some slightly different properties uh, from, from the quarks themselves, uh, which allow us to produce this pairing or coupling of, of two of them together. And so these are the um, sort of the main uh, types of hadrons we see in experiments at, at Jefferson Lab. And I'll talk a little bit more about them, but before we do that, I'd like to give you a bit of an analogy for this strong nuclear force as we get into thinking about um, what's different uh, between it and other forces you may know more about. Uh, so the gravitational force is something we all experience every day. Uh, we're held down to the surface of the Earth by gravity, uh, and that is something we, we all uh, can experience. Um, and we know that as we um, change the distance between an object and the very heavy object like the Earth, we can change the strength of that gravitational force. So we're held down tightly to the Earth by gravity, but someone on the International Space Station, a much larger distance from the Earth, uh, experiences a much weaker gravity. Uh, in fact, they float around inside of the, the ISS uh, pretty freely. And so what this tells us is that the gravitational force decreases in strength as we change the distance between the objects. So going farther away from the Earth, we experience a smaller gravitational force. And most of our forces behave this way, that the, the, the strength of the force really decreases as we separate the two objects experiencing the force. The strong nuclear force, however, is a little different in that here, if we have a quark anti-quark, say in this meson we were talking about uh, on the previous slide, uh, they're separated by some distance. And as we try to separate them to even larger distances, if we were to pull on that quark and anti-quark pair to try to separate them further, uh, we'd find that the force actually increased as we um, made them farther and farther apart. And this is sort of shown schematically here, that as we pull those two quarks farther and farther apart, this um, the gluonic uh, field connecting them uh, will, will need to stretch and the force will increase. So the energy required to separate them further increases as we move them farther apart. And it turns out that uh, actually as you move them far enough apart, um, it's easier uh, to just produce a, a new quark and anti-quark so that you'll have two mesons instead of one um, separated at smaller distances between the quark-anti-quark in each one. 
And so this unique property of the strong nuclear force uh, gives us some other features, uh, like a property called confinement, <clears throat> which says that quarks can never be seen in isolation by themselves, but need to appear coupled with, with gluons uh, so that they um, are not uh, some very large distance away from the neighboring quark uh, that, that holds them together. So this is a unique feature of, of the strong nuclear force, and, and there are others that we'd like to study to understand how these quarks and gluons behave in, in a better way. And so if we're going to study the strong nuclear force, we need to be looking at the distance scales that are relevant, so sort of the scale of the size of, of the proton. And so to do this, we need high energy beams of particles like we have at Jefferson Lab. And we can start by uh, studying well-known hadrons, like the proton and the neutron. Um, and so there we can build, uh, say, a target filled with liquid hydrogen, which is primarily um, <clears throat> the protons uh, that we can, can study with, with high energy beams of electrons and use those as a target. So we would have a target of protons, shoot an incoming beam of high energy electrons, uh, and measure the scattered outgoing electrons to understand the internal structure uh, of the proton. We can do this and compare with pretty precise theoretical calculations to understand the inner workings of the protons and neutrons. So that's one aspect of understanding this strong nuclear force. Another uh, opportunity is to uh, actually look for more exotic configurations of quarks and gluons. So we talked about mesons and baryons having two or three quarks inside of them, uh, but what about objects that have four or five quarks? Uh, it turns out these have actually been seen, uh, some quite recent evidence uh, at experiments at even higher energy accelerators than we have at Jefferson Lab. Um, and these observations are bringing some new insights into the strong nuclear force. Other options are uh, something called a glue ball, which because the gluons carry this color charge, they can actually interact with each other uh, and couple together or bond together to form uh, uh, a state made out of pure glue without any quarks at all. These are hard to disentangle from uh, our regular mesons because it turns out they actually carry many of the same properties uh, as our uh, conventional quark anti-quark system. And so one of the primary uh, goals is to look for another exotic configuration uh, of quarks and gluons, which is called a hybrid meson. So here we have a quark and an anti-quark coupled by the same gluonic field as a regular meson, but that gluonic field um, is in an excited state. Um, it has, uh, carries extra energy, meaning that this hybrid meson is heavier. It has a, a higher mass because of the excited energy state of the gluonic configuration. And it turns out we have both experimental and theoretical evidence that these uh, hybrid mesons exist um, and that their properties are in fact uh, exotic in that they can't be formed by a simple quark and an anti-quark system. And so the experiment that I'll tell you about uh, next is really aimed at trying to search for and study these, these hybrid mesons. You may say, uh, great, these hybrid mesons are something you'd like to go study, um, and, and mesons in general, but how do you go about measuring a meson? Uh, so like most things in, in high energy particle and, and nuclear physics, we need a, a high energy beam of, of photons, or high energy beam of particles, in this case, an incoming photon beam, uh, which you see shown here in the green arrow, uh, to collide with a target of protons. Um, and in that collision, we can produce an outgoing meson, uh, the state that we'd like to study, and also we uh, get a, a recoiling proton. Uh, so this is the target proton gets emitted um, and, and stays intact. And we can measure that outgoing proton. We have detectors that can do that pretty readily. Um, but it turns out that this meson is, is a little harder to measure in that um, sort of like a, a radioactive uh, nuclei, uh, it will decay uh, almost instantaneously in the detector. And so it doesn't travel far enough for us to be able to study this meson by itself, and we can't certainly can't collect them in a test tube and go study them uh, somewhere else. And so instead, uh, that outgoing meson will decay, and we need a way of measuring all of the particles that get produced in that decay. Uh, and then trying to map back what happened at the initial, initial collision of our photon beam and, and our proton target. So we do this by building a, a large array of detectors which can capture all of the particles that were produced in our collision. Uh, 
um, and then reconstruct uh, or sort of reverse engineer what happened at that initial collision point uh, from all of the particles that uh, are produced in that decay. Uh, so that's our goal, and the way we do that at, at Jefferson Lab is uh, through an experiment that's housed in uh, one of the experimental halls called Hall D. Uh, so you can see here uh, an aerial view of the Jefferson Lab accelerator where uh, this racetrack shape uh, of the road here is the path of our electron beam. And on one end of it, we extract the electron beam at its highest energy, and from that, uh, take it to uh, the Hall D uh, experimental area where that electron beam uh, is incident on a, a thin diamond wafer. And from that diamond wafer, we can produce a beam of photons, high energy particles of, of light in the electromagnetic spectrum. And that beam follows a path about 75 meters underground to a target inside of our uh, large detector system where we produce collisions of the photon beam with the proton target and uh, uh, sprays of particles are emitted from that and we have a large detector system built around that uh, to detect all the paths of those particles and measure their energy and momentum uh, and extrapolate back to what happened at, at that initial collision point. Uh, this experiment is called the gluonic excitation or GLUEX experiment um, and is the experiment I'm part of it at Jefferson Lab. So it's really hard to get a sense of what this experiment looks like without being there, um, but I'll try to do what we can with a video, uh, which was produced in the early uh, 2010s and shows the construction uh, of this experiment over about five years, compressed down to roughly 90 seconds. Uh, so the, you see many technicians, engineers, physicists working together over a really long period of time to build this roughly three-story tall experiment where the beam of particles comes in from uh, the left-hand side at the top of the screen and comes through the center of this large uh, cylinder that you see here in, in the center in red and green. And in the center of that cylinder, we have our target of liquid hydrogen, the photon beam comes in, produces a spray of particles, and what you see being installed inside of that cylinder are the many detector sensors that are required to measure the paths of all the particles in the experiment. And so hopefully this gives you some sense of the scale uh, of an experiment of this size, uh, what it requires both, both in terms of um, technical uh, feasibility as well as uh, the people required to, to put a device like this together, and the time scale. Um, an experiment like this might be planned for 20 years um, and have five years of, of uh, construction and installation and, and then run for another decade uh, in collecting data, and that's the phase we're in now. So with that, I'd like to give you a, a sort of a, a sense of the broader scale of, of an experiment like this, um, and many others at Jefferson Lab are of similar scale, where most of the projects we're working on really require an international scientific collaboration. So uh, GLUEX, the experiment I'm a part of, uh, has more than 140 physicists uh, from 30 uh, institutions, labs, and, and universities uh, across the globe, and really requires some significant technical developments. Uh, so those uh, pictures or the video I was showing you before of uh, all of the devices being installed uh, have more than 30,000 sensors uh, that are required to continuously operate and measure the trajectories of particles and their properties as they're produced in these collisions. In addition, uh, we have to record a very high rate of, uh, of data so all these sensors are measuring uh, things in real time, and we need to record that so we can uh, study that data offline, uh, which is a whole separate uh, lecture in, in itself. Um, and so the scale of the data there is something like a gigabyte of sec a gigabyte of data per second. And to give you a, a sense of scale, uh, if you were downloading a full-length Netflix movie every few seconds, that would be roughly the scale of a gigabyte a second. So it's really quite a bit of data to to be writing uh, to uh, disks and, and other hardware, um, and then processing offline. And finally, a bit about the status of our particular experiment. Um, we've been operating since uh, the Jefferson Lab upgrade was completed several years ago, and recorded many petabytes of data uh, that we continue to, to analyze uh, over the years. 
Some of our first observations were um, in measuring the production of a charm cork meson. Um, and it turns out that um, by studying this, we can provide some new information on the gluonic content of, of the proton. Uh, and finally, we continue to uh, observe and study uh, the so-called conventional mesons, uh, these quark anti-quark systems, uh, and continue to search for uh, and hope to study these hybrid mesons and other exotic hadrons. So with that, I think I'll uh, end and, and thank you and, and take any questions you might have. Thank you, Justin. Uh, this is Lauren. I'm going to read the, um, the questions that have been pre-submitted. I would also encourage those that are attending um, on YouTube Live to type in their questions now in the YouTube Live chat box. Um, the first question we actually just got in our YouTube Live chat, which is, what kind of software do you use to analyze that data? Did your team code that software? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so we use uh, entirely open source software, and by that I mean it's not a, a commercial product that's provided by a company, uh, but something that's really open to the community. Um, and it turns out that nuclear and particle physicists have been doing this for a while, and there are a lot of tools that are sort of readily available for the broader community. Um, so we use uh, primarily a package uh, called ROOT, uh, which is provided and used in, in experiments at the Large Hadron Collider uh, at, at CERN um, and many other nuclear and particle experiments around the world. Um, and underneath that, um, most of us are coding in either C++ or Python um, and, and using those as, as the mechanism to, to build our software. But like most experiments, it really requires uh, kind of a, a development of uh, a fundamentally new uh, software system uh, for each experiment. There, it has to be tailored to the particular hardware you're analyzing with, uh, what kind of computers you have uh, to do the data processing. And so it's really an effort of um, you know, tens of people over uh, more than a decade to develop the software that's required to analyze uh, the data we've collected at, at GlueX. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, how big or small are the particles that you're studying, such as protons, mesons, et cetera? Right, so as I mentioned um, at, at the beginning, uh, the, um, the scale of, uh, distance scale of, of the um, proton that we're interested in, in studying is, is something like a femtometer. And actually, an experiment at, at Jefferson Lab has, has done a pretty precise determination of that distance scale, that protons are, are on the level of, of meter in, in size, and, and the mesons and, um, and other particles produced in our experiment are of a similar size. So nothing that we could hope to uh, build a device to um, measure um, with a, a ruler or something, um, but of the sort of femtometer type scale. Um, and then once they decay, uh, those particles will be emitted over a wide range of angles and, and positions. And so the fact that they decay and, and have some carry some energy allows them to be uh, emitted over a, the large detector that we have. Um, and so even though the particles are quite small, uh, we need a very large device to be able to take a snapshot of the particles as they travel through our, our detector. Okay, the next submitted question is, we talk about particle physics. Do you think the quark of quarks as physical hard particles or more like fields or quantum variances? Yeah, uh, really good question. So um, the the quarks uh, we think of both as uh, uh, well the quarks and gluons we think of as sort of being a particle wave kind of uh, duality. If you think about uh, light uh, and we we think of uh, the photon, the particle of light, uh, behaving both as a, a particle and and a wave. Um, and so another way of thinking about that is, is being a particle and, and a field. Um, and it turns out that the, the way we can describe uh, this um, theory of, of the strong nuclear force in quantum chromodynamics is a so-called quantum field theory, meaning that we can describe uh, the interactions of quarks and, and gluons as, uh, uh, as quantum fields, uh, and we can make calculations that, that um, can try to describe the, the data that, that we see. Um, so we think of them both as being sort of fundamental constituents, uh, as in like we think of the electron as being really a, a fundamental object, uh, 
um, but also behaving like a wave or like a field. And so we can do calculations in that sense. Okay, the next question is, what exotic particles have you seen or studied at Jefferson Lab? Yeah, good question. So um, the, at Jefferson Lab, we're interested in, in studying both uh, sort of conventional uh, quark, anti-quark systems, uh, as well as, um, go back here, uh, some of these more exotic varieties. Um, so uh, one of the possibilities uh, that was, was studied recently after there was a, a discovery of uh, one of these five quark uh, type pentaquark objects uh, that was produced in a, a higher energy accelerator um, at the LHC, uh, it was proposed that we could search for it at Jefferson Lab. Um, and so we actually did a, a study where we went to look for um, this five quark pentaquark type object in, in the GLUEX data. Um, it turns out that the, this pentaquark object has a so-called charm quark inside of it, which is a heavier version of the quarks inside of the proton. Um, and that means that we can measure a particular um, particle produced called the JSI at GLUEX, um, which is believed to be part of that, um, the, the structure of this five quark object. Uh, and when we did that, we, we looked and, and didn't see any evidence for this, um, this pentaquark object in our data, which means that either it's not produced in uh, the, the GLUEX data and, in a way that is similar to the way it's produced in, in other experiments, um, or uh, we simply haven't acquired enough data yet to see this very rare process. Um, so in addition to the search for hybrid mesons, which is, you know, one of the main thrusts of our gluonic excitations experiment, we're open and aiming to be uh, accessing other exotic hadrons uh, and have done some studies already that do nice comparisons between experiments because really it's a global effort amongst many experiments required uh, to search for these exotic particles. And any one experiment by itself is, is um, a little hard to really stake full claim on, um, but really having a confirmation by another experiment is one of the um, sort of grounding principles in our field to try to have some reproducibility in different ways of producing these kinds of particles. Okay, hey, Justin, this is probably the last question we will have time for. Um, what is it like waiting five years for a detector to be built, and what is the experience of seeing it for the first time, the results for the first time? Yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> so uh, these experiments take a while to build. Um, that's right. And so what often happens is that um, in the process of building one new experiment, you're analyzing data from, say, a previous experiment. So you may have some uh, analysis going on in parallel to that uh, construction of, of the new device. Um, but it's really um, a unique experience in our field that it happens, you know, once a decade that, you know, big new devices like this come online. Um, and it, it really um, is, is exciting. There's a buzz uh, in the what we call the control room uh, where we have people uh, working to collect the data in real time. Uh, there they'll be monitoring computer screens and, and viewing the data as it's coming in. And seeing some of those first collisions uh, and being able to look at that first data um, is an extremely exciting experience. Um, it's something that you might get a few times uh, in your career uh, working on this. So it was really um, an exciting time um, early in the process when we had that first data. Um, but now is also a really exciting time. Uh, we have this enormous data set that um, sort of goes beyond anything that's been seen in, in this photon beam experiments before. Um, and so we have really unique access to look for these hybrid mesons. And so we're, we're really looking forward to what comes out of that. Thank you, Justin. That's all the time we have for questions. I'll give it back to you now. Okay, thanks. Well, let me thank everyone again for um, joining us today for, for Bite Size Science. Um, glad uh, you could participate and, and uh, put the questions uh, in, in the chat. Um, I'd like to let you know that there's the next iteration of our uh, lecture series is coming in two weeks on June 17th, uh, where Camille uh, Ginsberg uh, from the Jefferson Lab Accelerator Group will uh, tell you about accelerators uh, smashing atoms for science and, and where those electrons come from that we use uh, in, in Hall D. Um, so uh, look forward to that, and thanks everyone again. Uh, a recording of this video will be posted on this YouTube channel um, shortly after we end today.
So thanks again and, and have a good afternoon, everyone.